Hey, how's it going and welcome to the first video in my Ghost in the Shell retrospective. This is a series of videos I've wanted to make for a very long time. As in, I remember thinking about this idea in like 2017, but for one reason or another just kept putting it aside in favor of other stuff. Ironically, despite me not really talking about it on the channel like at all, Ghost in the Shell really does stand out as being one of my favorite media franchises. And throughout these videos, I hope to take you on a journey through the various anime, movies, manga, and more the series has to offer in roughly chronological order. So what is Ghost in the Shell all about? In my mind at least, it's the best Japanese cyberpunk series. Starting its life in 1989 with the original manga created by Shiro Masamune, it and all future adaptations revolve around the agency known as Public Security Section 9, a squad who handle matters involving cybersecurity, counterterrorism, information warfare, and any other highly specialized odd job you can think of. Some members include the main character in series face, Major Motoko Kusanagi, who possesses the most advanced cyberized body of the team, and has quite a few different designs and depictions across the series. Chances are, or even if you know nothing about Ghost in the Shell, you've seen the Major. My personal favorite character is the lovable Bato, who has the best sense of humor out of the crew, but sometimes lets his temper get the best of him. Togusa is the least cybernetically enhanced member of the team, and is also a dedicated family man, essentially making him a relatable window into this world. Finally, Aramaki is the chief of Section 9, and is the brains behind the entire operation, serving as the political back end for the team to function. Those are the four the stories tend to feature the most heavily. However, it really is the technology, world, and vision of the not-so-far future that the series paints which makes it so memorable. The line between human and machine has become increasingly blurred, with mechanically augmented cyber brains being commonplace. These cyber brains allow people to connect to machines, the internet, and each other, simply by plugging themselves in via physical outlets on their own bodies. Memories are able to be stored on external sources outside of the brain, and likewise skilled hackers are able to hijack a cyber brain and cause irreparable damage to them. In extremely rare cases, AI are capable of attaining self-awareness and affirming their own existence. In an age where it's possible to quite literally disassemble an entire person and put them in a new body, back up your memories and more, it begs the question, at that point, what even is a human? That and other philosophical and moral issues are at the core of Ghost in the Shell, and they're explored with varying levels of intricacy throughout the entire series. But fear not if that's not really your cup of tea, since Ghost in the Shell is kinda just fucking cool. It provides exhilarating and realistic military sci-fi action in a world that feels so technologically close yet so far. Characters can become invisible for stealth takedowns, or ride around in these mobile tanks with AI called Tachikomas, or fire guns that look like this, or fight guys with cybernetic bodies that look like this. It's just awesome, and I think if there's any reason to get into the series, it's that it manages to do it both. Some series have really interesting themes and philosophical questions that are brought up, but are otherwise kinda just boring. Some series have great action and settings, but otherwise don't really leave you with a lot to think about. Ghost in the Shell, however, has both of these aspects on lock, managing to be both entertaining and meaningful. Throughout this retrospective, I hope to cover pretty much all of the major inclusions within the franchise, although like with most of these big Japanese series, there's a lot, so I can't get into every single piece of media ever produced for it. Expect me to eventually cover all of the big ones such as the various movies and anime series, but where better to start with than the original 1989 manga? So as a quick heads up, unfortunately all of the scans of the manga I was able to easily find are based on the old English printing from back in the day, which for whatever reason was flipped around and presented in the American comic style of going from left to right. So just keep that in mind if you're trying to follow along, I know it's a little disorienting since this is a manga, but... Fortunately, the version that I own, that being the most recent hardcover set published by Kodansha, does preserve the original format and is generally just a pretty nice set, so I recommend picking that up if you're interested. Despite being a pretty big fan of the animated Ghost in the Shell stuff, I never really felt that much of an urge to read the original manga. I think mostly because I just never heard that much about it. I kinda just assumed it was one of those series where it was more about the idea that the manga brought into existence rather than the actual content, so I never got around to it until recently. Recently, and I gotta say, I regret not checking it out sooner. 
For this review, I'm not going to be extensively covering the plots of the various chapters since I think that's best experience for yourself. Rather, I'll just be giving a brief overview. It's structurally episodic with an overarching story only being introduced in the last few chapters, so it allows the characters to just jump from story to story, which I think kind of works in its favor. It allows for the manga to introduce concepts and world building at its own leisure, rather than being constrained to one fixed series of events. Before we really dive in though, I wanted to just remind people about the time period this was created in, and how ahead of its time it really was from a conceptual standpoint. Although I personally think of it as the best Japanese cyberpunk, it certainly wasn't the first, with series like Akira, Dirty Pair, and Bubblegum Crisis having beaten it to the punch by several years. In the futuristic year of 2029. Jesus, Ghost in the Shell is seven years away? Fuck. That terrifying realization aside, as the opening chapter states, it is the near future. The world has become highly information intensive, with a vast corporate network covering the planet, electrons and light pulsing through it, but the nation state and ethnic groups still survive and on the edge of Asia in a strange corporate conglomerate state called Japan. It's entertaining, but a lot of the manga is pretty typical cyberpunk fare. Themes like the effective merging of government and corporations, the cyberization of people, hacking, all that good stuff is here. But what made Ghost in the Shell so different was its focus on the interconnectivity this at the time new internet thing was gonna bring, and the effect an increasingly digitized world would have on humanity. Virtually everyone is capable of plugging into this network via their cyber brains, and it makes for an incredibly strong concept which the entire rest of the series would be built around. There's just so many possibilities for stories involving this one idea, and I think that really is the manga's strongest suit and why Ghost in the Shell ended up having such staying power. Despite the ominous and badass introduction though, the manga surprisingly doesn't take itself too seriously, and at least in the beginning prioritizes being fun and entertaining over trying to be deep. The tone of the manga is a fascinating blend of an incredibly serious world and situations, but with a cast of characters that goof around more than you'd expect. The easiest character to point to when it comes to this little facet is the main character herself, Motoko Kusanagi. One thing that immediately stuck out to me is how different she is compared to her later counterparts. Although I suppose it's more accurate to say how different they are compared to the original. In the manga, the major is much more goofy, sarcastic, playful, pouty, and generally more expressive compared to her animated counterparts. She makes a lot of those 80s and early 90s anime girl faces I like a lot. In fact, the entire manga has a more expressive art style than I was expecting. Masamune really goes all out with the funny looking faces on characters. If you took a lot of these panels and sometimes whole pages out of context, you'd never guess this is about cybercrime and the nature of the human soul and terrorists. Despite her more kooky proclivities, Motoko does ultimately take her job in Section 9 pretty seriously when the situation calls for it, and especially later on becomes more down to business but never really loses that sort of youthfulness. It's a fun version of the character and she really gives the manga its own unique vibe and just feels very 80s. Reminds me a lot of the girls from the previously mentioned series Dirty pair. Other characters provide a similar level of comedic relief, especially Bato who makes some really funny looking faces. Masamune gets really good use out of the relatively simple shape of his head. He kind of just squishes and squashes him around into all kinds of different weird shapes, it's great. The art is awesome, it's a mix of playful and gritty that works much better than it maybe should. Masamune especially shows his propensity for drawing machines throughout it. The walking tank Fuchikomas have a really cool design. These guys are the manga's version of the iconic Tachikomas and they look sick. You get a lot of great detailed drawings of them in the chapter introduction pictures alongside the characters, and they have this real bulk to them that I like a lot. He does a great job bringing the settings, vehicles, guns, and technology to life with his detailed art, and provides some pretty exhilarating action to boot. The realistic gunfights, car chases, and shit exploding on display are a blast. You know, literally in some cases. In terms of the overall aesthetics of the manga, my absolute favorite thing about it is the very analog and, well, cyberpunk view of the future it provides. I'm a sucker for this kind of style with lots of wires and cables and crazy looking computers. Reminds me a lot of the designs from the earlier Shin Megami Tensei games and y'all know how much I love that shit. There's something that's just so cool about this approach to sci-fi that I wish was more prevalent nowadays. 
Just seeing these elaborate, wired up artificial bodies and brains connected to big machinery brings a smile to my face. I just really like the idea of a reality where we can make cyborg people go invisible, but the best way to carry data around is still a fucking CD. Technology kind of has this weird quirk about it now that I'm thinking of it. It's only cool when it's either brand new or really old. Like nobody's going around talking about how sweet DVDs and CDs are, but nowadays VHS tapes and vinyl are hot shit. I guess people have this habit of finding outdated stuff to be sort of cute in a way, but there's definitely an aging period to it. It has to develop past just being inconvenient and become essentially obsolete before it's remembered fondly. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the two-page lesbian sex scene that happens and the interesting story surrounding its removal. So basically in chapter three, Masamune decided to draw a full-on lesbian sex scene involving the major and two other girls. I mean, they're really going at it. Titties all over the place, pussy he's getting pussied the works. Besides the author just being horny, it's also there to show that you can link up with other people and have e-sex with them. So it's kind of like Discord or Final Fantasy XIV. Like I said, this manga was very ahead of its time. But the kicker is that it only really works if you're linked up with somebody of the same sex, and it basically allows you to feel the sensation that the other is feeling. So like, when the major is sucking a titty, it feels like her titty's getting sucked, and they also get loaded up on drugs to enhance the experience. The reason why two people of the opposite gender shouldn't do this is because you'll experience sensations your body isn't supposed to. Basically, if you were a dude and you did it with a girl, you'd feel the cooch you don't have and it'd hurt really bad. This is essentially what happens to Bato when he calls the major during her girls' night. Sadly, this scene ended up getting cut from later printings, including the most recent Kodansha release I mentioned. However, the interesting thing is that Masamune himself was okay with changing it around. Apparently, he was getting flack for the scene in Japan, and decided since it wasn't that important to the story, he'd change it around so the plot would still make sense, and kind of just gloss over the lesbians. At least in this case, it seems like Masamune was more in the mindset of, eh, fuck it, I'll change it, rather than feeling like the story story would be better with it gone. Personally, I can understand why it was taken out since it basically is just porn, and that kind of stuff causes problems with getting things republished and localized and stuff, but I think it's also a legitimately interesting and creative aspect of Ghost in the Shell's world. Also, apparently in his illustration book Intron Depot 1, he said, I drew an all-girl orgy because I didn't want to draw some guy's butt fucking base. I've actually saved my favorite element for last, and it might be a bit of a strange one. I don't think I've ever had an experience quite like reading through this manga, and that's due to the author's very unique approach to, of all things, notes. And what I mean by that is Ghost in the Shell is absolutely and completely inundated with author's notes. Ordinarily, a mangaka might include the very occasional note within the actual pages for stuff they deemed important. Maybe they fucked up some continuity thing and couldn't really fix it, so it was easier to just jot down a note or whatever. But in general, it's something you want to try to avoid since it can distract the reader from the experience. In those brief moments when you read an author's note, the barrier between reality and fiction is broken, and you end up remembering that this was a comic made by a dude. But Masamune says fuck that and writes about everything you can imagine. Concepts that directly tie into his story. Philosophical questions he ponders. Justification for why he did or didn't do certain things in the manga. Recommendations for books from the 1980s, many of which were never published in English. Explanations about a character's state of mind and actions. These are things that in most manga would either be included in the dialogue or text, or just left up to the reader's imagination. But with Ghost in the Shell, it's almost like you're experiencing two different things. On one hand, you're trying to read this cyberpunk manga, and on the other hand, Shiro Masamune is constantly telling you stuff. Kind of like if you watch a movie with your friend who's seen it a million times and he just keeps telling you shit about it, it's a very odd, almost meta-feeling experience since it makes the manga feel like a direct window into this man's mind. Typically with art, and especially manga, you can infer a lot about the creator just from reading it. For example, with Hirohiko Araki's Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, without knowing anything about the man in real life, it'd be very easy to tell the kind of music and movies he likes just from reading his story. It's also likely you'd come to realize what kinds of topics interest him, since he'll often incorporate out there phenomena or philosophy throughout the story, and this is also reflected in the abilities of the characters. This is in contrast with Masamune, who literally just interjects with whatever he wants to tell you about outside the boundary of the story, right underneath the page. One thing I should probably specify is that these notes are handled a little bit differently just depending on which printing you're reading. 
For the scans I've been using, they opted to put the notes at the very end, whereas the more recent Kodansha printing has them at the bottom of the page where they originally were. So just keep that in mind if you do decide to read it. But in some weird way, I almost find the notes to be more interesting than the actual stories being told. Since ironically, he tends to save most of the philosophizing for these. It's sort of like reading somebody's diary since sometimes it feels more like he's just talking to himself, rather than trying to prove a point about something. Masamune seems like a pretty interesting dude, and there's something really charming about his approach here. It makes Ghost in the Shell an experience that you'd be hard pressed to find elsewhere, and it makes the manga feel very personal. It's kind of to the point where I feel like I can no longer separate this manga from the guy who made it. But I don't know, I kind of like that, it feels unique. This would get old pretty quick if every manga ever made did this, but I think the approach here made the manga a sort of special experience, and it's one that I'm glad I had. I think if you're interested in seeing where it all started, some fun characterization, great art, and unique author interaction, then the manga is worth checking out. However, I would also say that it's sadly in sort of an awkward spot when it comes to recommending it to people. What I mean by that is, if you're brand new to Ghost in the Shell, I feel like there's better ways to get into the series. The 1995 movie especially is a great vertical slice of what Ghost in the Shell is all about, and Standalone Complex is excellent. Likewise, if you're already into the series, the manga might paradoxically feel been there, done that, but also maybe slightly off-putting. Many of these chapters would be adapted into later stuff, especially the 95 movie. However, it's also pretty different tonally, especially with the major, so that might end up causing a little bit of whiplash. Overall though, I'd still recommend it. The original run from 1989 to 1991 lasted 10 chapters, and even though they are pretty long chapters, you could realistically read the whole thing in a couple of sittings. But yeah, that has been the first video in my Ghosts in the Shell retrospective. Thank you all so much for watching, and especially a big thank you to all of my channel members. But yeah, this is something that I'm really glad I finally decided to do. Like I said, this was an idea I had back in fucking 2017, so... It's something I've been sitting on for a long time, but I think I'm finally ready to kind of tackle it. The next video in this series will be covering the 95 movie, which is legitimately one of my favorite movies ever, so I'm really excited for that one. I don't know how regularly I'll end up doing these. I would like to have the whole thing finished at least like by the end of the year, but we'll just have to see how it goes. But yeah, thank you all so much for watching. See you guys next time.